Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, and it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here and um, to clear, make that clear right to the beginning. Every Swiss cow has a name. Uh, unfortunately, 50% uh, of them are called Heidi and the other 50% Rosely. So I don't know whether that uh, really uh, should be changed and uh, there is more to be studied. Eventually, they should have some names of boys, etc., to make clear that the production is really related to the name. So, uh, this today, I mean, I'm here because I know uh, my dear friend uh, Denham, Charles Denham, and uh, he said, Come here, that will be very interesting and hopefully a very important meeting. I saw you today the first time, and I have to say, I'm impressed. I'm really impressed about. Uh, the way you introduced, the way, the passion that came over, the commitment and the dream you have. And I think that is really amazing. The dream, I think, is crazy, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> as dreams should be. And I will cite from the commencement speech uh, of the president of Liberia at Harvard uh, 2011. She said, if your dreams do not scare you, they are not big enough. <laughs> the size of your dreams must always exceed your current capacity to achieve them. And I think that's precisely what you do. Uh, you have a dream, everybody will say it's crazy, but you say it's of my size and once, uh, one day we'll achieve it. The second thing I was impressed this morning is your attitude toward the group and to say, I'm not going to do it by myself. I want to do it with a group. And with a group, we may achieve it. And here again, let me, and I will then stop always quoting. I don't know whether you know this uh, quote from Margaret Mead, uh, 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 an English philosopher. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And congratulations. I think you are on this track, and <laughs> congratulations for that. Oh, no, really. Today. 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 Really. Today. Today. Charles, uh, Ch Ch uh, Charles Ch Chuck told me it's not a meeting, it's not that kind of a pleasant meeting. You just come, you have a, a couple of discussions, and then you go home, and actually at the end of this meeting, nothing has happened. This is a meeting about commitment, this is a meeting about action, and this is a meeting about uh, creating a movement. And uh, I was wondering, what is actually the action, what is the commitment we need to address to really uh, achieve the goal you're setting yourself? I mean, many people in this room, me personally also in Switzerland, we have been working on patient safety. And as you said yourself this morning, in some respects, we have to say things have become worse. 10 years ago, there were fewer people dying of medical errors, of uh, failures than today. So obviously things how we did them in the past do not, are not enough. And if we look into that and look how and how can we change the way we uh, offer medical services today, then we have to say the biggest threat to patients today 
is overuse, underuse, misuse. It is really the way the system is aligned. It is the fragmentation of the system and it is not uh, enough to fix hygiene, hand hygiene, it's not enough to fix medi uh, medication errors, it's not enough to fix uh, injection safety or uh, surgery safety. You really have to work on the system itself. And to work on the system, that means to integrate this fragmented system and to make the system work all together. And that's the difficult task ahead. And to do that, and I think uh, you're very well positioned, new technologies will help to do that. I'm a strong believer that IC technologies uh, can make a ba major difference. Uh, secondly, we have to look into the processes and we have to look into uh, to really align the processes not only in the hospital, also in the hospital, but from the beginning in ambulatory care to, uh, to uh, the hospital setting, the outpatient setting again. And to bring that all together, that's primarily a question of leadership. We need leaders who are able to bring that change uh, over. And I think uh, uh, not one leader, a group of leaders, and probably, and uh, Chuck has mentioned that a couple of times, it's a, a matter of creating a movement. And how you create a movement, luckily enough, there is good studies out there how to do that. I mean, the best example, and we have been studying that at Harvard again, the best example is actually the first Obama, Obama campaign. Uh, how you were able to mobilize huge amount of people uh, is, really, uh, is really key. And you can learn from that. You have so, uh, chosen three issues. I think they are extremely well taken. And as, as you heard today from Ed, they are, at least two of them, are in conformity with the priorities of WHO. They are, to some extent, uh, to some, uh, in some respect, surprising. Because they are not the current thinking we have. I mean, uh, failure to rescue is not really very well known in the medical community. It's certainly not well known in the circle of politicians I'm involved with. If I would uh, talk to a minister of health in any country and would say, listen, one of the problems in patient safety is uh, failure to rescue, they would say, huh? Uh, because they never heard of that. They would know something about uh, safe injections, but not about this problem. The same is very true about what uh, you were saying, we were talking about on um, blood safety. Blood safety uh, is considered only on the product side, but that there is an overuse and that we can work on that just new land and uh, congratulations to do to do that Co uh, I can announce that and it's a kind of a premier tonight that WHO has actually decided in the last couple of days that medication errors will be one of the priority areas of uh, WHO and uh, with the power and the wisdom of WHO and the outreach out in 194 countries, I think we can make a major step forward in that respect. <laughs> Let me just give my reflection on how can we change the global picture. I think there are like three drivers which will help. The first is really the question of costs. 
in every country I know, healthcare costs are a problem, are a headache. And uh, to bring the cost increase down is really something uh, everybody uh, is thinking about. And luckily enough, everybody agrees that integration, integrated care is the key factor, which will, bri will bring down overuse, will reduce costs, and at the, at the same time will uh, increase safety. And that's the good news of a win-win situation. And I see that uh, politicians, they don't jump too much on patient safety, but of course they jump immediately when it comes to costs, because uh, at the end, in all the systems, part of the costs is taxpayer money, and that is a burden in politics. The second thing, I see, and I think that is uh, not really uh, estimated enough, is that we see growing inequities, inequities in health in many, many countries. And that, uh, I mean, patient safety is one of the parameters that, you know, the number is going up. Uh, if you would look into what classes, what social classes are affected, what are the hospitals they were in, then you would see that there are uh, really socio-economic factors in it. And uh, we see in many countries that you have centers of excellence. Now, you have very good hospitals uh, in Brazil in Argentina, in India, in Thailand, anywhere. But these hospitals are kind of islands of happiness in a, I wouldn't dare say in a desert, uh, in a desert, but they are really centers of excellence and the rest of the country, the rest of the his, uh, system is not there. And they're kind of, gated communities for the rich and famous. And what we see is that with the growing power of middle classes in many of the emerging economies, the middle class say, we do not accept that anymore. We do not accept this inequity. And we are working and we want systems where we can participate and have the same access. So I think this growing p uh, power of the middle class will have a major impact. And finally, of course, all of us want health and health systems to work such that we would give our children, our parents to the system. We want, if we go into a hospital, we want to seek and get help, and we do not want to get harm. As we do not want to get harm or violence if we seek help in a police station uh, because we want protection. And I think that is uh, intrinsic, uh, motivation that uh, will bring us further. And uh, it was alluded uh, today a couple of times. I think the two pr other factors will be very important politically. And, but at the end of the day, it is an ethical, ethical question that we want not to be harmed when we seek help. Let me finish with uh, uh, my personal story about uh, patient safety. And I'm now talking about my personal experience as a doctor in a hospital. It was back in uh, 1978 and I was a resident in a university hospital in the Department of Urology in, the, uh, in Switzerland in a university hospital. It was the first weekend I was on duty by myself. Of course, I was well prepared. The head of the department uh, was talking to me and showing me all the cases, gave me his mobile, etc. So everything seemed okay, and I was even very proud to do that work. At 3 o'clock Sunday morning, I was called because a patient was screaming. You could really hear her screaming in the hall when going down the ward. 
And I went into this room, and there was a woman weeping, screaming, and uh, I knew she was, had uh, bladder cancer, terminal bladder cancer. We were expecting that she would m might die. And we tried to ask her what's wrong with her. Uh, it turned out that she came from Albania, former Yugoslavia, and we couldn't understand what she was saying. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, we tried to find someone in the hospital who spe speaks Albanian. Hopeless. I called uh, the, uh, the, my boss and said, what can we do? And he said, give her more opiates as much as you can and as much as you are allowed. We did that. She screamed and continued and it seemed not to work at all. Then we said, uh, let's get the anesthesiologist and uh, an hour later the anesthesiologist came. 20 minutes before he came, she died, screaming to in, out of her body. And we were all so devastated. I mean, can you imagine this woman from a foreign country in a foreign hospital dying in these conditions? We said, how can that happen? How can that happen? And it's not even a medical error, so to speak. It's just a procedural error that nobody had thought that we should be able to talk to someone in that language. And that brings me really back to the question of leadership. Uh, leaders in health should be able to take care of patients but they should also take care of their employees and collaborators. Because uh, good leadership would have meant that you really think of all these conditions and that you prepare all these things. And uh, we felt at that time very alone. And I think uh, leaders must also think about bringing joy, meaningful, work to collaborators that are in the system. Tomorrow, I'm very excited to see your president, uh, former president. I'm very excited to see the commitments. And I will finish with a quote, uh, which I found also of one of your former presidents, and uh, as a matter of fact, it's the former president who came into office 1913. I don't know, I will not ask you who was that, uh, because uh, you should be good in history, it's Wilson. And uh, he said something wonderful. If you want uh, to make enemies, try to change something. Make enemies, try to change something. Thanks a lot. <laughs>